Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the seventh UCLAX Film Fest. My name is Pascal Cohen Olivar, and I'm the director of the Arts Department and Program Director for the Entertainment Studies Unit at UCLA Extension. Our program covers 11 different disciplines, and we serve over 2,000 students annually. We started UCLAX Film Fest seven years ago as a way to showcase the work of students and alumni in our directing, producing, cinematography, and screenwriting programs. And we are now expanding to celebrate our film scoring students as well. UCLAX Film Fest is open to all who have taken at least one class with UCLA Extension Entertainment Studies or the Writers Program. The film that you will watch throughout the weekend were selected based on direction, cinematography, creativity, story, and entertainment value. Winners were determined by an esteemed panel of judges who are also accomplished entertainment professional and our instructors, Scott Edwards, Kim Elman, Samuel Gonzalez Jr., Justin Rakskiewicz, and Miles Yaksic. The festival is intended to connect our students to the entertainment community. In a moment, we're gonna get the festival started with a live industry panel. And throughout the weekend, we will host live panels with our festival filmmakers and with industry executives who will discuss the process of making their short films. We are also excited to celebrate in person for the first time in three years, tomorrow on the Fox Studios lot. The event is full, but we're excited to see those of you who have already RSVP'd. We will wrap up the festival this Sunday at 3.30 p.m. with an award ceremony, immediately followed by a virtual networking event where everyone is invited. This year, the winner will, of each award will receive a free enrollment for any one UCLA Extension Entertainment Studies class, in addition to prizes from our sponsors. Our six winners will receive the latest Final Draft software from Final Draft, the Director's Viewfinder app, Artemis Pro, and the Cinematographer's Light Simulation app, Helios Pro, both from Chemical Wedding. They will also receive Movie Magic scheduling software from Entertainment Partners, a 4K drone camera, a backpack, a popcorn maker from Fox Entertainment. I want to extend a big thank you to our generous sponsors. I really hope that you enjoy this virtual festival. There is a lot of content for you to explore this year. In addition to the screening of this incredible student and alumni film, our students have each a dedicated page on this site with filmmaker bios and interviews. And now I would like to introduce you to Lysel Davis, our fabulous Entertainment Studies event coordinator, who will give you a brief tour of our virtual festival. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, I am here to show you around the website. Uh, so you have a sense of how to watch the films, how to learn about the filmmakers, how to see when the panels are taking place and join the panels. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So this is your main page and uh, Ashley will be putting links in the chat, but it's watch.eventive.org forward slash UCLAX Film Fest 2022. The hub where you will be watching all the films and the place where you RSVP'd for the screenings is right here. If you haven't RSVP'd yet, I recommend you do so by just ordering your UCLAX Film Fest 2022 tickets. I've already done that. So <laughs> as you can see over here on the right, are all of the films. You can watch the films straight through and enjoy them one film after another or in, in a curated showcase that we put together for you. Or you can select a specific film that you're interested in, just watch that. The Audience Choice Award button will be available starting tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, Saturday morning. So watch your films now, get a sense of what you want to win and start voting that will close out at noon on Sunday. Um, also, if you want to get a better sense of the films, you can look at each film. These are all 20 of our films. You can pop into them. I'll just show you an example. We'll pop into Dandelions. You can watch the, you can link to the main page to watch the film here. You can learn about the synopsis, the director's statement, where the director was when they, or, you know, where they were in their mind when they were uh, 
making this film and then all of the cast and crew and some stills or some behind the scenes photos. So that's very fun. Um, go back to browse films, this is kind of our main page. You can sc go down, scroll down and see all of our panels. This panel is starting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We have an 11.30 tomorrow morning. We just have the two morning panels tomorrow because we have our film, our film festival, Fox Studios lot party in the afternoon. If you've RSVP'd, we're so excited to see you there. It is closed as Pascal mentioned. But you can also see our panels on Sunday as well. We have a 10 a.m., a 11.30 a.m., which is specific to film scoring, and then an another executive panel, more from the executive point of view and so the creative point of view on Sunday. So both panels talk about how to break into the industry and um, how to continue to thrive once you're in and one from more of a creative perspective and one from more of an executive perspective. So it's a, hopefully really helpful to our filmmakers. We also have this final award ceremony. You can link to that here. You can, any of these, when you want to do it, you can pre-order your ticket on the day you come back and you just click to watch, you can also click this line to join. Very simple. Um, and last but not least, you can watch interviews with our filmmakers here and by clicking on their images and learn more about our sponsors here. So, and thank you to our founding sponsors. And, oh, uh, I said last but not least, but one more thing. You go over to our welcome page and you just wanna see something a little bit more laid out when it comes to our events. You can see tonight's event, the filmmaker panels, the Fox Studio lot party, as you see, I have a ticket, um, and then the rest of the filmmaker panels and the uh, award ceremony on Sunday. So I hope that clarifies everything for everyone, but you can always email us at um, entertainmentstudies at uclaextension.edu, or if you're having tech challenges, this need help button is the place to go. Eventive runs this website and they can help you with all tech challenges. So please go there. They're on top of it. They're amazing. They really help people a lot. So thank you. Thank you for joining our festival. We're so happy to have you and we're looking forward to an exciting weekend. Thank you. Lysel, thank you so much for this comprehensive tour. There is indeed a lot to explore. This year's panel and discussion will focus on breaking into and thriving in the entertainment industry. Our panel discussion will be led by renowned filmmaker, marketer, and distinguished UCLA Extension instructor, Kim Edelman. So please enjoy the UCLA X Film Fest 2022 this weekend. And don't forget to vote for the Audience Choice Award. You may vote until Sunday at noon. I will see you Sunday at 3.30 p.m. for the award ceremony, where we'll also be raffling a free class for the fall. And now, please welcome Kim Edelman, who will introduce our panel. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be moderating for us. Just a couple of housekeeping things. This panel is being recorded, so we would encourage everybody who's not one of the panelists to keep your camera off um, and your microphone off. And if you have any questions, because we would definitely want to cover information you want covered, please put them in the chat. And then once we uh, talk amongst ourselves a little bit, I'm going to throw it open to the chat questions. We'll pull them from the chat and I'll throw them to the panelists to answer. Um, so go ahead, questions in chat. We'll start talking. And one of our panelists is uh, in transit. So I think she'll be joining us shortly unless she's back, but we'll find her very quickly. The topic for today is gonna to be how to break in and thrive in the entertainment industry. And we're very lucky that we have four fabulous people who are gonna share their information with us. I'm gonna actually just go ahead um, down the row and have them tell you what they do. And then we'll, for our first topic of conversation, if you panelists could give a recommendation of what do you think is the most essential skill that someone who wants to follow in your footsteps and thrive in your field should have. So let's go ahead and start with the order that we were listed in originally in the panel um, description. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I should also say everybody's full bios is on the panel description if everyone wants, if any of the audience would like to go and read those. Uh, but Stefan Smith, if you wouldn't mind being our first uh, person to share with us what you do and what skill do you think is essential that somebody should have if they want to get into your field? Sure. Um, my name is Stefan. I am a film composer and also a violinist and violist. I play a lot in uh, motion picture soundtracks here in LA. Um, and I would just say uh, globally, um, having a great personality and being able to be prompt on time, but being a friend and a colleague. I would say that. That's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, actually, um, Tazba Chavez, I believe, is not back yet, but she'll be with us very shortly. So I'm going to jump ahead and go to Peter Lauer. Peter, would you like to tell us what you do and give us your skill that you think is so essential? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a television director, and um, I think the, uh, well, another skill that uh, Stefan has he didn't mention is he, he rescues dogs. <laughs> That will definitely win, win over uh, people in or outside of the industry. So um, that's a good skill. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, th I th honestly, I think there's two. I think hobnobbing before you get the job is a, a great skill, one that I wish I had myself. And then preparation once you do have the job. I think uh, uh, I, I'm a firm believer in the, the, the efficacy of preparation. Um, and always uh, being curious, I mean, you know, educating yourself constantly about uh, you know, the more the more you put into your into your head, the more you have to offer down the road. Excellent, I love those. Uh, and dog rescuing also very important. <laughs> and then Jeanette Volturno, would you let us know what you do and what you would recommend as important skills? Absolutely. Hello, and thank you for having me. Um, I am an independent producer. I came up by way of visual effects and then through the production department and built and ran Blumhouse for several years and ran the production over there and then branched off a couple of years ago and went into direct independent producing. And I would have to say the skill set that would be the thing that would help you survive would be to pivot and swing, to learn how to pivot and swing because everything is constantly changing and you just need to figure out how to go with the flow. I think that's so true for so many jobs, for sure. Yeah. I, and then um, I'm assuming Tazba has not joined us yet, but they'll let us let me know when she comes, and then we'll go back and grab her for her uh, her tip as well. So you know, really, this panel is supposed to be about breaking in, and so uh, obviously, all of us have at some point had a, what we would consider a big break that allowed us to either move up higher than we that you know move up to a higher level, or maybe it's the very first break to get into the industry. Um, I'd love to hear what everybody would consider their big break, and I'll go the other direction now. Let's start with Jeanette again. So I would say a lot of the things that have happened in my career were because I stated something to somebody, and then it manifested in my life. So I stated to somebody that I wanted to find out how a major motion picture studio worked, and one of my friends said, let's go have lunch at Sony, because I know some people over there, and I was being myself and being very personable at this lunch. And after the lunch, I was asked if I wanted to take a, partic a particular job that they had there for me, not going thinking that I was doing that I was I was going out of curiosity. Um, so that's happened to me several times in my career of just putting it out there of what it is that I'm looking for, and then having the universe reciprocate that back to me in um, offers or opportunities and, and doors being opened. Um, but I would say the one that landed me the name recognition success was when I did Paranormal Activity and I took the film and um, was asked to recreate uh, the ending, to, to figure out the ending, to figure out the middle, to go back and forth. And they were looking at it, um, they being DreamWorks at the time, was looking at it as a uh, template for what they would do for the movie if they were to remake it with known actors. So it was like their playground, their storyboard for they would bought this project, they liked the project, but they wanted to see what it would look like and play with it a little bit. And it turned out that we had so much fun playing with it and it tested well with the audiences that they released what we had done based on what Warren had created and put into the film festival. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> I love all those stories, actually. That's great. <laughs> um, Peter, do you want to share what you would consider was your big break? Um, well, I had a, I, my, my, my big break was uh, getting an internship at MTV when it was new. And uh, they didn't know what they were doing. So if you had an idea they liked, they'd let you go out and make it, whether you were qualified or not, which I definitely was not. But I started making things uh, for MTV, and uh, and well, there, back in those days, cable was a very small world in New York, and um, Nickelodeon was adjacent to MTV there on the, like the floor above us, and so we we all mixed together, we all hung out together, and 
couple of guys at, at Nickelodeon got a, 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 their first show going called The Adventures of Pete and Pete and asked me if I would direct some of that. And, and that, that show just it, it kind of uh, gained a sort of a, a crossover audience. The kids showed it, it gained a, like a college audience. And based on that, really ever since then, it's been word of mouth. Like that led to Strangers with Candy and Strangers with Candy led to, you know, numerous, I mean, Strangers with Candy still, still um, yields benefits to me today with, uh, with you know, the, in the comedy world. Um, so it, yeah, that was that internship, which my school wouldn't let me do. My school wouldn't let me take it. Um, for various reasons I won't go into, but I, um, I, uh, so I basically broke into a card catalog and got, you know, found a card that said MTV with a phone number and I called them and just did it on my own. So there's some kind of a lesson there, but there is no path, but you have to make your own path, maybe something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think so far that does seem to be kind of our theme and let's see if Stefan will get agree with us as well. I totally agree with that. Um, uh, for me, I feel like I have two paths as my performance career and also as a composer, but I think what got me uh, more into the forefront as a composer was just being in the room that uh, a lot of these people um, find themselves in. So being on the scoring stages, you're there with the producers, the directors, uh, all, everything in po or all sound in post is there listening to this. And when we would have breaks during recording, you're talking to people on the lot. And next thing you know, like, oh, I write. And they're like, oh, send me a link. And I mean, it's crazy because the other day I was recording, I can't say what film it was, uh, but we were recording at Fox and I ended up meeting the whole post team at uh, for Fox and Disney. Uh, through the orchestra contractor and they wanted to hear my music and um, and another big break recently happened where I uh, just scored my first WB picture so I'm excited about that. Um, it was an hour and 27 minutes of music which is insane uh, but um, yeah it's just being in the being in the right place at the right time and and making your own path and just meeting as many people as you can you know because you never know who knows who. It's wonderful. So. And we're going to keep on talking a little bit more about Big Break, but I'm very excited to announce that Tazba Chavez has joined us. Yay! Hi. <laughs> thank you so much for being patient. <laughs> oh, no, thank you for joining us. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to go back and talk to you for a little bit and let you tell us a few things and then we'll jump. We'll all be on the same page again. Oh. So could you just tell everybody who's listening what you do and then what you think is the skill that's most essential skill for somebody who wants to do well in your field? Yeah, um, so my name is Tazba Chavez. I'm a member of the Bishop Paiute tribe um, from the Navajo Paiute and San Carlos Apache people. I am a television writer, director, and producer. And um, the question was, what is the most important skill? Is that what you asked? Yeah, exactly. Like, so if somebody wants to follow you, what do you think would be a good skill to make sure that they have? Well, I think that, that um, you know, there are three very different hats, but I think for me, what is at the core of all of them is the ability to be a team player and to be able to, whether that, because in a writer's room, you're writing with a bunch of other writers. As a director, you're leading a whole team towards a common vision. As a producer, you're working with all sorts of departments to make something happen. So I think for me, um, teamwork, it's, it's, to me, TV truly is a team sport. And that's one of the things I love about it. Good answer. Um, and so then the other thing that we were just talking about when you just joined us was what, what, what would you consider your big was your big break that either got you first in the industry or allowed you to jump, you know, in levels? Yeah, um, I made a short film back uh, a while ago through at and Hello Lab. So it was a, a fellowship where they selected five up and coming writers and directors and they matched us with um, people who were very established in the industry. And so we got to work closely with um, these mentors who were executive producers on these short films and um, they financed the films. And it was that film that when we, we premiered all of those shorts together, that's how I got representation. They had invited managers and agents to the premiere. And then that night I had some folks approach me and I didn't understand how that worked yet. So I didn't get when people were like, we would love to talk to him. Like, okay, that's cool. Like, and, and I, in fact, my representation had to, who, who represent me now, they had to call me three times 
And they kept being like, do you have questions? We're just checking in. I was like, okay, like I totally didn't get it. And then finally, it's like, it's I'm very literal. Like if someone wants to date me, they literally have to be like, I want to date you. And so the same thing with this, where they finally had to, we're trying to work with you. I was like, oh, I just thought you were calling to say, hey. Um, But it was that short film that went on to, um, be my big break that that was able to communicate what my vision and my voice was it's also the thing that continues to get me staffed and hired today so um I think if you know when you have an opportunity to make something like that it kind of can be your calling card um in many ways and thank you because that's a perfect transition to my next question which is um what advice would you give people who have taken UCLA extension courses to gain skills in their chosen field, which I assume is most people who are attending this panel, um, but haven't gotten their own big break yet. What can they do to set themselves up for success? Mm-hmm. So um, why don't you continue talking about that and then we'll go back around to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things, and I, I don't know how much you guys have talked already, but I continue to take UCLA extension classes um, every quarter when I can and I have the time. It was great during the pandemic because you could do it online. But even prior to the pandemic, I would be in a writer's room all day and go take a class once a week from seven to 10. And the reason I mentioned that is because I think one of the things that that you can do is really look at what what your skill sets are and really be honest with yourself about this area I'm really strong in, but these areas I'm I'm still growing or I don't know where there's a gap of information or knowledge. And I think use that information of the places you don't feel you know super confident in or the places that you feel you shy away from enroll in a UCF extension class to fill that. So, you know, for me, I would look at it and say, okay, I, um, I like prior to directing my first episode of television, I was like, I'm going to take a class. I'm going to take an acting class and I'm going to take um, directing actors to the camera because those are the areas that I was feeling the most nervous about before directing for television. And so I think continue to like, just look at where your gaps are and start filling them because then when the opportunity presents itself, you feel more prepared and more confident and your skills have grown um, in order for you to do a good job at the opportunity. That's fabulous advice. And and Peter, what do you think for somebody who wants to move into directing? Because I know so many people graduate from school, they've directed a short, they feel like they want to be a director, but it's so hard to make that jump from, you know, I want to be a director, actually getting work directing in TV. What would you recommend you, people can do? I'd recommend they not do it. Um, <laughs> you don't need any more directors out there. No, but but the uh, I actually, what, what Tazbaz said, I, I, I would like to, uh, uh, jump onto because you know continue to take classes I, I think is a great idea and I, I, I like a, a phrase that's out uh, that's out there in the zeitgeist it really bothers me is fake it till you make it and I I couldn't disagree with that that approach more I, I th- especially when you're young because when you're when you're young and you're starting out that's when no one expects you to know too much I mean you 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 can where it's where you can freely say I I don't you know what what is that I don't know what you just say. I don't know what that is. Tell me. And you can, you can just be a sponge. You know, I think it's a great, I mean, when you can be a sponge, you should be a sponge. You know, you think, I forgot the question. No, no. <laughs> if they want to, because I think it's so hard to make that jump into directing TV. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is there something specific into, if you're real, you know, your heart is sent on, I really want to direct TV. And it's so hard to make that leap. Is there anything that they can do beyond taking classes, beyond continuing to shoot to increase their reel? Yeah, okay, I'll, I can get, I can, I'll tell you, tell you what, what, when I was uh, starting out, I went to, to see uh, the great independent film uh, director, John Sayles speak. And, um, and somebody asked the inevitable question, you know, what advice do you have for, for people who wanna direct? And he said, one word, he said, direct. And it sounded kind of, sounded kind of glib, you know? But, the, but that's, but that's true. I mean, because like I said before, there, there is no path really. I mean, there's no path unless you have connections. I didn't. So you, you, you need to, you, you have to make your own path. So what he was suggesting, and this was much harder back then because you had the, back then you had to, you had to rent your equipment. You had to get, you know, a lot of lights. It cost a lot of money. You had to have your film transferred, all that kind of stuff. Well, now it's easy to do all of the technical aspects of, of filmmaking, the problem is everybody can do it. So there's much more competition now. But there's also many, so many venues to get your work seen in theory. 
so I, I guess John Sale's advice, I would, I would just echo that, which is um, if you want to be directing, start directing, start making things. And that's always the advice for writers too, right? If you want to be a writer, write. Well, they say writers write. Yeah. So you, you're already writing if you're a writer. <laughs> and Jeanette, what do you think? If somebody wants to get into, you know, the working for a big company like Blumhouse or, you know, producing in general, what do you think they can do beyond taking classes? You know, it's an industry where it's a business and you have to remember that it's a business. And so you have to figure out how you are creating added value for people and why they want to work with you. What is it that's making you different from someone else? What are you bringing to the table that's different? So when I was starting off, um, I would do budgets for free for people because I wanted to practice learning how to do budgets and I did them over and over and over again. So when um, when I worked on Paranormal Activity and Jason Blum uh, asked me you know, if I would break down a project for him and how much I charged, I said, just if the project goes, just hire me again and I'll, and I'll do that. And he lost his mind because he was like, who are you and why are you doing this? And I said, well, I'm, I'm showing you that I have value worth. And I believe that, you know, this is something that I can bring to the table and, and that it separates me from that. And I also understand the post process. So instead of having a post supervisor on it, the first X amount of projects that we did, I was, you know, the the line producer on the project and the post supervisor on it. So I separated myself from people, gave myself an edge, created something that made it worth hiring me for, and then delivered on that. Um, you know, I, I also, because I've met with so many people, I've spent a, a long time over the last few years, um, several years, um, really helping bring people up and into the industry that my colleagues and I created a podcast called Catch a Break Podcast, which are all the things that you wish someone would have told you when you first started off in the industry that they didn't tell you about. <laughs> so I invite you to check out the podcast because that will help fill in some of those things. Like I wow. had this, I had this thing in my head that when I went to network with places that I had to walk away with 30 business cards in order to be successful when I first started. And I realized that it wasn't that, that it was that one true connection of the person that you wanted. And that was enough. And that was true and special. And if I could grow that relationship and really focus and pay attention on that, that that was enough from that networking event that I went to. So uh, that whole fear of not speaking to people, not knowing what to say, not feeling like that awkwardness of all of that, like you need to look yourself in the mirror, do your mantras, whatever it is that you do, and understand that you are great at who you are and what you're doing. And you just need to find that match of the people that are your, your fit, because finding that, that family, that film family is what is going to help you with your energy, propel yourself further in the industry. That's also fabulous. Um, somebody from Extension, if you could put in chat the link to that podcast, that would be really fabulous because it would be great for us all to, that's wonderful. I will gladly recommend that podcast. And let me ask you just one more question before we jump to Stefan, because his is very specific too. Um, you probably see a lot of resumes from people who are just getting out of school. Is there yeah. something on the resume that like you could care less about or you're really are looking for or any tips to people who are doing their resumes when they're writing? Yeah, it's so funny. Back in the day, and this was like 30 years ago, I was working at a commercial production company and I, I hired somebody because they had a sense of humor on their resume. At the very bottom of the resume, it said made a killer cappuccino. And I will never forget that because I wanted to hire that person just because they made themselves stand out and be different. So it was something that was on there that was like, oh my God, and it, you know, it was before like Starbucks and all of that stuff came out. I'm really dating myself now. Um, but I was like, this person has a sense of humor. Like I want to hire this person. So it's anything that's on there. That's like, these are my passions. These are the things that I like. This is who I am as a person. This is what I'm bringing to the table, the uniqueness. Like, I don't care if you have one thing on your resume, it's about who you are and what your personality and your vibe is. Wonderful. Thank you for saying that. Because I think a lot of people are very intimidated of like, I have nothing to show on my resume, or I don't know what to put. And the answer is to be yourself. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right, Stefan, yours is, a, yours is a good question because it's like, okay, obviously the people have to be talented musically. <laughs> Let's go ahead and say that's a given. Mm -hmm. But knowing that, what else can they do to set themselves up for success? 
Um, I, I can just echo what everyone else was saying. I mean, um, Jeanette, it's Jeanette, right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. She, she hit it on, um, hit it out the park because it's like, when you bring yourself, your own personality in, into the equation, um, there's so many talented people in LA, you know, like if you put out a call for a composer, you'll have, you guys know, you'll have hundreds, maybe thousands of people uh, submitting links to that or whatever, but it's always about the personality of uh, the person that's trying to get the job, but also how they work as a teammate. And so I just think it's important that you are your truest self and finding those ways to connect with people, like she said, who, you know, slowly become your tribe, because when you help someone, they're going to help you back. If they're excited about how passionate you are um, and you're excited for them, it's like the cyclical process where everyone's watching out for one another and they're like, hey, I heard they need a production designer on this. Like, let me hit up my friend over here, which I worked on this project with, or, you know, it, it's just, it, it's so, so much of it is so tightly knit. So people are very guarded and they have to trust people that they're working with. So the more people that you can find that you can form those genuine connections and that can be going, finding a guild, you know, like some type of guild of screenwriters guild, or, you know, we have, music supervisors and things like that they throw mixers every month go to these things find people that you might vibe with and it, yeah it is scary but even if you walk away with one like she said that could be a valuable connection that could get you work and then you meet more people and it just you know spider webs out so i totally what? agree let me ask you this though. Do you think the people who want to get into music, should they have like a website that shows all their music? Do they need to have a reel of music? Well, like for I, I would say if we're going to be specific to yeah. composers, yeah. then um, I think it would be important for you to definitely have a high quality sounding reel um, and something that is literally one link that takes you to everything. You don't want anyone having to find your bio, your credits list on a different side, of, just have everything. And a lot of composers use Real Craft, uh, Real Crafter as a, as a link to send their portfolios. Um, my, my, I'm represented by Spectra Creative Agency. So my agent has an entire page with all that set up that's super easy and friendly. Um, but yeah, just something quick and easy that you could send to people. Also, business cards are a hassle. So there's an app that I have that literally is a QR code on my phone that I can turn around, someone points their camera and it shoots all my information to their phone and saves it into their address book, including composer, my info, everything. So all they have to do is type in, oh, I forgot his name, he's a composer, and boom, I pop up. So it's like being ahead of things and, and taking advantage of things that most people aren't. Like for instance, uh, some people know of the Clubhouse app. Um, and in 2020, everyone was sitting at home bored as all hell and uh, not knowing what to do. And I was on IG and Clubhouse and, every, and, and everything, just talking to random people. And there were so many um, Hollywood industry rooms where people were connecting, collaborating, and which ended up landing me a job uh, with a uh, film that I wrote the score for, for Tribeca, that was produced by Tribeca and Procter and & Gamble and is still going around touring at festivals, winning like a lot of awards, which is awesome. But that all came from me just meeting people in a clubhouse room and also, the Warner Brothers pick also came from Clubhouse. So you just never know where you're going to meet people. So like everyone said, carve your own path and find unconventional ways to make connections because people are over cold emails. Um, you know, like, so find ways, like if they have an assistant or something like that, find out more about that person. What do they do? Do you vibe with them and then build that relationship? And then eventually they'll intro you to the person that you want to talk to, but do it in a genuine way, because long story short, everyone wants to trust every member who's on the team. So. Wonderful. You know, I've, been on, I've been on truth social and it's like crickets. Nobody's out there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for being so specific, though. I think it's really, really helpful to everybody. And I know we've gotten some questions, and I encourage anybody else throw in more questions to chat. I've just got a couple more questions I want to ask the panel, and then we're going to throw it out to group questions. So, um, so here's a tough question. Uh, things are rapidly changing in the entertainment industry, and no one really knows what the future holds. But if you were to advise someone who wants to build a career in the industry over the next 10 years, what avenues would you recommend pursuing? Any thoughts about what the hot future careers are going to be? I'll throw that out to anyone who wants to 
give an opinion about what the future holds and where to go and what to do. Don't make me call on you. All right, all right. Okay. So I think um, great content is always going to be needed. Always, always, always going to be needed. And um, it's exploded and, and it doubles over years, right? And uh, again, going back to the fact that this is a business, people, companies want to make money off this. People want to see things. Focus on your first few projects being mainstream to get you up and running. And then you can go into your passion projects that are indie darlings or fringe darlings or things that are on the outside. You need to establish yourself first and show that you understand the business of what it is that you're getting into. I'm hoping that theatrical stays around a little bit longer. Please go see things in theaters. Um, and the streaming business is changing. So, you know, being able to do content, content that is you know, two hours in length or a series in length, like having that flexibility of understanding what it is that you're making and for what platform or viewing area that you're making is, is also very important. Yeah, I worry for theatrical, I really do. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts about where the future is going or where to maybe put some time into or certain skills to build out or anything of that sort? It's a tough question, I know. I, I don't so, really know what I'm talking about when I say this, but my, my, my son is a video game designer. And we talk from time to time about you know, the use of narrative in video games. And, and he's always at, you know, defending, well, video games are narrative. There, are, you know, there's, there has to be, there, there has to be some way, not, not, to, not to involve, not, not to use the gaming, the gaming aspect of video games and, uh, with narrative but to use the interface, there's got to be some way to employ the, the, the gaming interface in the, in the exploration of narrative stories that hasn't been, that, that hasn't been done yet. There, does this make any sense to any, does this make any sense to you? <laughs> there, there must be something, there's something. You know, that actually been you've touched on something that um, the gaming industry is actually going to supersede the film and television industry in the next few years in terms of where the younger generation is spending more of their time. So figuring out how to bridge and connect those worlds is right on and all of the VR that's happening um, will need content and content created for it. So yeah, you're right. There is something there. I was just going to say the importance of really using your social media platforms to be able to reach out to people and ask for help or link. Um, I can't say how many times, like a lot of people I've heard uh, are very scared. They're like, oh, well, they have all these followers or maybe they don't have followers, but they're a very famous person that you don't think would ever respond. You will never know if you don't do it. So I just think sometimes reaching out on platforms like that and also putting out quality content on those platforms can get you even more of a following or attention and um, that you necessarily would not get if you're not using that to streamline things. Fabulous. Any other thoughts? Anybody else? Well, I think we've actually got quite a few questions now, so maybe we'll throw it out to questions, shall we? Uh, let me see, and I'm going to read them to you. All right, okay, here's the first question um, from Tony in the audience who says, I'm a screenwriter who went to UCLA Extension. Yay. What's the best way to network in the film industry, especially gearing towards screenwriting, which we really haven't talked that much about? Anybody want to take that? I mean, we definitely look at stuff that goes through things like um, festivals, um, the blacklist. You know, if you can get yourself out there and get yourself listed on some of these things and get some some good reviews, some good wins, and get some some you know press under you for any of these things, that gets your name out there. Um, you know, again, writing, 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 and and coming up with these pieces and throw your name in the hat to be able to, you know, take a take a pitch on something and and get out there. Uh, you know, I teach low budget filmmaking at UCLA Extension and my art, you know, I tend to say, don't do it if you're not interested in it, but that horror really is a great way to break in. That, it's an excellent way to break in because it's, uh, you know, it's it's generally a lower budget area that, that um, can get greenlit uh, pretty quickly. And the reason why horror is something that um, people lean into is because globally, 
we're all afraid of the same things. Um, you don't have to read a subtitle. You jump at something. You, you're afraid of something. And, and it translates well, whereas comedy could be slapsticky. It could be dry. And the same sense of humor doesn't necessarily translate in other places. Dramas, you have to read too much of the subtitles. You know, action translates. Action is another one, but that's expensive. Like, unless you're doing it in a particular way and you've got particular people. But horror, you can do with three people in a house. Like, it's, it's very contained and easy. To be able to and, and there's also like horror film festivals that have screenplay writing competitions as part of them. And I would imagine companies like yours do look at those. Yes. Because it's yep. kind of, the pipeline is there. Yes. Yep. Um, I'd be interested, uh, Tazba, I'm sure you read a lot of spec scripts while looking, TV scripts while looking for staffing and things of that sort. Is there anything that you would recommend to people who want to write out spec scripts for TV? Well, this may be unconventional and conventional. I love unconventional. <laughs> I, and I also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing for um, shows and working on shows that are of a specific community. So I'm Native American and we, and that's the community that, you know, the shows that, that I work on. And I will say that going back to the relationships thing, which I think you guys are going to keep hearing over and over again, but a lot of being staffed or getting your start writing also are the relationships that you're building with, with, um, and sometimes that's with people who you're not even going into it necessarily that you want to be in the industry you want to write. And the reason I say that is because on most of the shows that I've written and directed on, not everybody was a screenwriter that got hired. We had a lot of stand up comedians, poets, people who were writing short stories that the showrunners and the other producers, when we really looked at like what kinds of voices did we want in the room? It was less about their sample and more about who this person was and the life experiences that they could bring to a room that were not already represented. And so, you know, if you're coming, you know, there was a room I was in where we had someone like me. I worked in the beauty care industry for 12 years before I tra transitioned into this career. There was a woman who was a pharmaceutical defense attorney before she was a, a, a screenwriter. So like, there's all sorts of people out there that, are good storytellers and maybe it's in a different medium. And so I only say that, and that's why it might be a little unconventional because like, you know, this is just in my experience that we've brought a lot of people on as staff writers who they had to have writing samples, of course, but they weren't always scripts. Sometimes they were like 10 poems they sent over or like five short stories. Or I have a showrunner who hired somebody off of their Instagram videos because they were hilarious in, in their, um, their stories and the way that they were matching comedy with the way that they were using music that you can add to your story. Now, of course, when she reaches out, she has to read something. She needs some kind of like, you know, um, proof that you can put a story together. But I think one of the things that's happening is I think we're starting to look differently at who storytellers are and who counts and who's allowed to be in a room. And I think the more that we've diversified storytelling in these rooms, the truth is there's not a lot of Native American writers out there that you can be like, please give me this perfect spec script. It's just, we wouldn't have us in the room. And so that's just something that I've noticed within our community that we've really opened the door. And I think it's been really beneficial because you end up with a writer's room full of people with life experience from backgrounds, and stories and that's even outside of the the native shows on the non-native shows I've worked on it's been the same thing and so um I, I I say that because I think we're in a different time of staffing writers where I think we're more interested in who is this person is this a person that I want to work with eight months out of the year is this a person who makes me laugh who can pitch story and, you know, don't underestimate the backgrounds that that any of you have prior to writing or directing, because those skill sets all play in once you're on the team and everybody needs to be good at a different thing in a writer's room, you know, so. That's wonderful. No, that's wonderful advice. And yeah, that, exactly. Like a life led contributes a lot versus somebody who, uh, you know, might just only have their college experience and that's all they have. Mm -hmm. um, do you, ha when you're looking at other people's scripts, so are there certain kinds of scripts that everybody kind of writes as their um, spec script, or do you recommend they write their own pilot script as a calling card? Or I haven't seen a lot of spec scripts. Um, I've mostly seen pilots that people have written. Um, I I don't think I've come across 
very many spec scripts. I, I really think it's original content and original um, stories that we're drawn to. And part of the reason why I think we're drawn to that is because what we're looking for is a specific voice and a very clear voice. And I think that comes across a little bit easier or it's, it's easier to read when somebody's writing an original um, story versus in the voice of a show that already exists. But that's just in my experience. Like I don't, I cannot speak for all of the other shows that exist, but <laughs> once I've been on, I find we gravitate towards the people where we can see their distinct personality and voice in it, because that's what we're trying to put on in the writer's room team. Perfect. And Peter, do you ever look at spec scripts or no? Oh, we're, we have you on mute. We've made it impossible for you to talk. There we go. Ah. Um, the uh, uh, Tazba just reminded me of uh, way back in the in the in the day. I, I, I took the uh, the infamous um, uh, story structure uh, class. Um, Robert yeah. McGee. Robert McGee. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. McGee. Everyone McGee. used to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, took, I took McGee, and, and McGee, McGee was said uh, said. Uh, Form doesn't matter. You could, you could, you could, if you have a good idea, you can send it on, on a roll of toilet paper. Hollywood wants good ideas. Now I've submitted a lot of toilet paper, and they <laughs> didn't sell. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> but, but Tesla, also, I agree with her totally. Like at MTV back when, back when it started, nobody who was in there with me, none of us went to film school. It was, it was all people who had other back, other, other life experiences. Um, that was an unusual place at the time. Um, but, but I thought that was a very fertile, fertile ground. Yeah, totally. And did do you I read, do I read spec scripts? Um, I, I, I read, I read scripts of, of, uh, but not, not spec scripts. You no. read scripts you're shooting, obviously. Um, is there, so I'll skip asking you any of that. And also we'll just do a quick plug for UCLA Extension. The UCLA Extension Writers Program has turned out many people who have had been very successful in television writing. Um, let me jump onto another question here. Uh, here's the question of Nikki. How do filmmakers contend with increasingly shorter extensions, excuse me, attention spans and fast content on social media? I think it really applies to all of us. So if everyone's just watching social media, how, how, what, what do we have for longer storytelling? How, what kind of things can make that still attractive to people? I'll throw it out to the crowd. Anyone have any thoughts on that? It's a tough question. How do we compete with social media? I mean, again, it goes back to finding something that's a great story. You know, if you have a great story and you have a great team that have come together to all contribute towards making that, then, you know, it's there's so much that goes into it. There's hundreds and hundreds of people from the team that that starts with the infancy of the idea that starts putting the packaging together that gets it financed or sold that creates it that then markets it because if you create something and you don't know how to market it or it doesn't get marketed properly you've missed that that piece as well so it's really all about what that seed that story that main piece is about and then you know understanding how to how to get it out there how to get it made and how to get it out there and to a certain degree, I don't think we have to go against social media. I mean, a lot of people now make their living on social mm -hmm. media, and it's a lovely venue that wasn't available before. And, you know, content creators, um, I hope we could be a little agnostic and be like, you're a content creator, whether you're making something for TikTok, whether you're making something for YouTube, whether you're making something for cable TV or streamers or for the big screen. It's all expressing yourself. And, Agreed. <laughs> and video games and books and video everything, games. you know, it's yeah. all, it's all, it's, it's all content. Yeah. I think the tricky part is always just how do you get paid? But that wasn't the question. So uh, next question is, I'm 45 and just ventured into screenwriting and aspire to be a director. What advice do you have for this mid-life crisis career shift? I feel like we've co covered a little bit about that, but um, can I um, promote, the, the, there are also various um, training labs for directors that, the, that are encouraging for diverse voices. And I don't know if any of you have had any experience with either hiring people who've gone through the labs or um, have gone through them yourselves or anything? Well, I mean, you, Tazba, you did through the AT&T thing. Yeah, I, I went through that program 
For sure, that was helpful. I also took UCA extension classes to fill in gaps. I also, you know, I started making films when I was very young, when I was probably like 14. And then, you know, I took a lot of film classes in college. So when I switched over, it wasn't, and I also interned for the Sundance Institute for their Native Indigenous program. So it wasn't, I had like a lot of like little, like little, but I had I had some experience to a certain degree and had made short films over the years prior to making the transition. But what I will say is whatever career that you've had previously, those skills are applicable into directing, especially if you've been in leadership positions in companies or like retail stores or whatever. I think that if you come from um, a previous career where there's good um, teamwork that you've had, you've had good leadership skills, sales skills. I mean, one of the things that I think helped make the transition um, a little bit quicker is once I was in a writer's room and directing, I would, I had sold, I like sold shampoo for like 12 years. And I was like, if I sold shampoo, I could sell a show. <laughs> like it's, it's just, you know, it just was, it was, it was just applying, you know, and it was like, I grew up being a basketball player and a point guard. So I was like, well, if you look at what you're basically running a team here and you're leading this whole team towards winning a game. So I just look at, I think, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of things that you're not going to have to start over having to learn that maybe young folks would have to, you know, if you're going straight into trying to direct at like, you know, 22, there's probably you, there's probably like really great creative skills, but it's hard to learn some of like the, the leadership skills and the, um, the team building skills that you learn when I think you have careers in other industries. And so I would just say, you know, look at, I don't know the field that you're currently in, but I know that if I could do it selling shampoo for 12 years and applying the skills of selling and teamwork. And I also, in that job, I taught leadership development and business acumen and facilitation skills. And those are all things you'll use in a writer's room. Those are all things you'll you're, you will use on a set. Those are all things you'll use when you're pitching. Um, so that's just my two cents on it. Um, it I think it was less the the director's fellowship and it was actually more the career that I had prior to that I just applied that onto a new um, industry. Great, and I can hear that you believe in yourself yeah. and that's so much of the battle. If, you, if, if you're a person that's coming in and you don't believe in yourself, no one else is gonna believe in you. So you really have to have that deep down like this is what I want to do this is what I'm doing come hell or high water and this is why you need to hire me because if you don't have that fire no one else is gonna see it uh, and Stefan you work with directors all the time what kind of qualities do you see in the directors that have done well or that you enjoy working with um I don't know like all, all the ones that I've worked with they're just so we're we're like so buddy buddy you know, like when we talk to each other, we're like cracking jokes and everything. It's just like this very collaborative experience. And then we're like, oh crap, we should probably get to work. You know, <laughs> so it's like, it's always that kind of feeling, you know, um, I don't know. I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, you guys have been saying some amazing answers already, so. Um, well, then I'm going to digress for one second. And just in the sense of, um, to, other than being buddy, buddy, for when directors have to talk to you about what they're interested in, what they want, what they want, or give you critique on what you've done or whatever, what do you, how do you recommend they do it? For somebody who's like, maybe, you know, hasn't had that experience yet and is scared of stepping on toes and, but this is such a collaborative, you mm -hmm. know, experience. I would just, uh, I would just say being absolutely honest of how you feel and not feeling like you have to speak in the terms of musical terms or, and, and same goes for the composer talking to the director. Do not talk to directors in musical terms because they will not understand it. And it's better to just, you know, speak freely. You know, you're not going to be like, maybe we should pair the violins with this here and then we can add. And they're like, what are you talking about? So it's just like, what's the character? What's the mood? What's the sound we're going for? Do you have any tracks that you're inspired by? What's your favorite scores? What do you listen to while you're reading the script? You know, like, Think using ways to like pry into them to figure out what they want because you know half half to three quarters of our battle is trying to figure out the sound world you know so I guess uh, you have to figure out that little ballet between you know communicating with one another and then being very constructive and not being um, driven by ego 
because many times no one wants to hear, you know, someone says, oh, you know what, I love that, but we got to change this. And some people get very much in their head about that. And at the end of the day, you are part of a team, like everyone was saying, and, you know, and your job as a composer is to deliver a product that one, you're proud of, but also that the director's proud of, that the producers are proud of, that they can put out into the world. Everyone feels happy with it because it conveys what the project needs to convey. So it's not just about you, it's about everybody, you know. I don't know. No, that's, that's a lovely answer. And actually, Peter, on the similar front, because we're kind of, we've kind of skipped post production a bit. What advice do you have for directors and and that aren't maybe a lot, very familiar with post production, but have to deal with post production? And how do you speak to people, or how do you prep to people, and how do you deal with the whole post production process? What advice would you give to someone who's just kind of starting out? Well, my my, my uh, post production process uh, is rooted in my prep process. It's a uh, I'm I'm a I'm a great advocate for um, for uh, thorough script analysis, and the, the script analysis that I do, which is performance based, but it, it, I, I carry that 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 informs every creative conversation I have, from my first meeting with the writers about the script, uh, through I mean I just I just wrapped up post on on Emily in Paris and the, and the on the my my, my discussion with the composer was was right out of my out of my initial notes which were i mean the, the one i don't know miss stephan how you feel like this but the when I, when I speak to a composer i like to use adjectives and talk about feelings thank um, you thank you <laughs> and by the way we love emily in paris my partner and i love that show it's got a great soundtrack the but but there, we, were, we, we had a, we had a situation uh, uh this one episode was kind of special and it and it, it um it had a fairy tale quality to to, uh, to it, and so when I was speaking with the with the sound team on the on the show, I'm like we're looking for it's it's a there's 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 an enchanted uh, an, an ench like an, an enchanted quality. So I'm uh, an enchanted fairy tale quality, and this we're in like an enchanted forest, and there's like a haunted castle, and these are these are the metaphors that I was using, but mostly speaking in adjectives, and that seemed to work. But in general, in post. It's the same, all the notes that I have for the actors, which go back to my script analysis, are the same notes I give to the editor. So uh, when I'm talking to the editor about, uh, about what I'm looking for, I'm describing what I, what I was going for in performance, uh, and to a certain extent with, with, with a, 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 great, a bigger story sort of thing, but it's, re it's really rooted in script analysis for me. That's great. And that's so helpful, you know, because people sometimes get intimidated because they think it all has to be, I need to talk about, you know, lenses or about uh, um, frame rate or something like that and not realizing that the importance is really communication and not specs. I've got another question from the audience, from Sarah, who says, how can you write in your own original voice and style if you need to worry about first writing projects being mainstream? Uh, Jeanette, I think this is because of your mainstream comment. Um, so she's I mean, just because you're mainstream doesn't mean that you're losing your voice. Um, you know, the way that you tell the story is unique to, to who you are and how you want to tell the story. The concept is what's commercial. And, and but everyone mainstream. having a voice is important, right? I mean, that's yes. what we talked about earlier. That's what people are really responding to, your unique voice. Yes. Yeah. And you, you definitely want to bring your own spin to it and how you describe it and how you how you're how your characters are coming to life but that that doesn't mean that the story is taking out of your voice like you know the story is is different from that um can i talk real quickly about film festivals too as we are at a film festival um and we did talk a little bit about how to interact with people when you're at the film festival but what do you you know if all of you if you were to attend the, hopefully you'll get to watch some of these films but if you were at an in-person film festival and you got to meet the filmmaker afterwards what would you hope the filmmaker i mean what would the film what do you, what would you like that interaction with the filmmaker to be when you compliment them on you know i just i saw your film i really liked it what do you think the filmmaker should say back to you in terms of networking. I've kind of mumbled that, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Jeanette, maybe, do you have a thought about that? I mean, I again, going back to what we've all been echoing on here, I, I want to know the person. I don't want to be pitched on something. I want to know who you are and if we're going to click and be on the same page and the same, we like the same things, we're inspired by the same things, we get excited about the same things, you know, so. Um, to have the conversation be authentic, to have it be real, to have it be like, 
what you're interested in. If I say I'm interested in race cars and you're interested in race cars and maybe we want to partner on a project that has race cars, like that's great. But, you know, if I say something and you say something else and, you know, that's cool, but maybe it's not what I'm vibing in. And, you know, maybe there's somebody else that would be a better connection for something and, or maybe it's the next project that comes down the line. So it, it, it won't always be a pair, but you're definitely, I'm looking for who that person is and what inspires them. Totally good answer. Um, it, we got a nice compliment that Glenn said, awesome advice, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Do we have more questions coming? Oh, hey, uh, why did I answer? We already answered Sarah's question. Um, anybody else from, because I, I can keep on asking questions, but I also want to make sure we uh, have a chance for the people, lovely people who are attending to ask questions. Any other questions from the audience? Well, I'll go ahead and ask another question and, and then we'll go from there. Um, and we kind of a little bit covered this, but specifically, um, if you had to give one piece, if you had to isolate one piece of advice you've gotten from somebody over the course of your career, what would you think was the best piece of advice you've gotten? So it's not advice you'd give, but the advice you were given. Um, anyone want to start us off? Peter's nodding. He looks like maybe he has advice. Oh no, I I, I um, the, uh, I, this question has came up uh, in in the past, and the the only I can't think of any advice that was given to me necessarily that, that like really landed on me as except for back before I was in um, doing this, I played in bands. And I had a, had a manager at one point who said, if you can't play a good show, it's better not to play at all. Oh, wow. And, and, but I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> you know? But that wasn't, I, but I, I believed it for a long time. And, I, and, there, and it's like, like for example, I mean, an example of how that would work out for me was if, if I was, was sent a script, a specific example, I, I, was, I was offered a pilot for, for, a, for a, a, a Steve Martin project. I love Steve Martin. Uh, I, 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 he was a, a hero of mine when I was a kid, and I, and I was so excited about this prospect. And uh, and it was it was mine. It was mine for the taking if I wanted it. And I and I got the script. I got the pages, and I turned it down. It was so not funny. I didn't want to be the guy who directed the Steve Martin pilot that wasn't funny. You know, because they're not going to blame Steve Martin. They're going to blame you. By the way. <laughs> well. I, they always blame the director. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about you, Jeanette? Was, can you think of a piece of advice that really has been kind of like a North Star for you? Sure. Um, so it hasn't always been easy as a female coming up in the industry. And um, I got a piece of advice maybe 15 years ago or so. Um, from some male colleagues that I was working with to take the emotion out of my delivery in whatever it was that I was passionately arguing or presenting or whatever. And that has served me when I deliver whatever information it is that I need to deliver or get across that I speak slowly and I take the emotion out of it and people hear it better and easier. And from a male female perspective, I watch what females are doing and how what males are doing as well and the reception of that information. And I'm telling you that piece of information has served me well through my career. Wow, interesting and important. And thank you for saying that. Yeah. Stefan, what about you? Um, I, I guess what I would say, what did I write down here? Uh, I, he prepped. Yeah, I, yeah I, well, I just wrote a few things down, but I put, don't be afraid to ask for help. I mean, that's something that I had, a, a, not everyone struggles with it, but a lot of people struggle with, like, you know, you think you can handle everything until you can't. And sometimes it's okay to ask for help, especially from people who may be able to assist you who have the life experience or the knowledge to get you to the next step. So, and also um, build, how, building a team that you can trust. Like what we we talked about, people just said that I can't write, you know, I can't do everything myself. So finding those people to help me and and uh, help us all help one another. Love it. And Tazba, what do you think? Do you have a golden piece of advice that has really helped you? Yeah. Um, the advice that I was given, which is 
something that I learned in like my retail days, but I have applied it to writing and directing is to trust people and to trust people to do a good job and to assume that they are going to do a good job. Um, and what I find is in a writer's room or when working with departments, when you instill your trust into people and you let them know you trust their ideas and you trust their instincts and um, you end up opening up all of these creative valves in them that maybe they're not always able to use. So I think it's the idea is that you're not being super controlling, that you're not trying to like control every aspect of it. Cause, cause you know, we're working with other creative people and we're working with people who are artists. And so for me, I have found like taking that piece of advice and applying it to rooms and applying it to, to, um, to different department heads, they will, when they feel trusted and they feel like they're making a contribution to a collaboration, they will present you with ideas that you could never even think of. And I think you just end up getting such a better body of work in your script and your pitches. And then even like the things that your production designer will bring you or like your hair and makeup will bring you. Like once you're, you're letting people know, like, here's what I want, here's the end goal. And I trust you, you're going to do a good, great job. And sometimes people will come and they'll present like, you know, like three options. I'm like, which one feels good for you? Like, and they'll be like this one. No, of course, sometimes if it's like very off, you're gonna be like, okay, great. But like, not maybe not that one. But for the most part, they really do. Like they work so much harder and they work so much happier when people feel like their creativity is trusted in and valued. And so that was one of the things that, um, you know, even in the retail stores, it's like when you have employees and you have to like get them to, you know, do certain customer service behaviors rather than like watching them, like, you know, you're, you're keeping tabs. It's like, oh, I trust you're going to do a great job today. And they do a great job today. So never underestimate, like, I just never underestimate trust now. Um, and, and how powerful that is of a, of a thing to instill in your collaborators. Um, totally good. And that actually, uh, we haven't really talked too much about working with actors. Um, and I'd love uh, maybe if you could keep on talking about that a little bit more and then we'll also throw it to Peter. What, you know, if you're a director who hasn't had a lot of experience working with actors, what advice would you give to somebody about working with actors? I would um, give the advice to take an acting class and to put yourself yes. in the position of what you're asking other people to do so that you under you you really understand what it's like to be on the other side of things um i also think any 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 classes or readings you can do on directing actors for the camera and sort of learning just sort of um like what kind of language inspires a person to change a delivery or a behavior versus you know the, there's, you know, actors are, 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 to me, actors are like very magical and they're like these beings that bring the story to life in a way that sometimes you couldn't even imagine. Um, and they're artists themselves and they have instincts and, and they also require positive reinforcement and trust instilled into them. But there's also a way um, in my, you know, I only always talk about like my stuff. I don't know how other people <laughs> do things, but I always think it's really important to be mindful of the way that you're speaking to those, those people, because they can make or break a scene. They can make or break um um uh, like a day, and it's kind of that thing of like, do you want to water it and watch it grow, or do you want to shit on it? Sorry for the bad language, and then make this person just that's whip. fine. Like, and so I think um you know it know what it's take some acting classes like know what it is you're asking people to do and then just be really mindful about how you're speaking to them and that these are humans at the end of the day and they're not machines and also know what you want like know what you want out of a performance because you will burn people out if you don't even know what you're looking for and uh, clearly that applies to where you were supposed to do as Stefan was clapping there <laughs> thank you so much for saying that <laughs> uh, and Peter do you have any other additional thoughts about um working with actors or advice to actors and working with directors? Um, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, best, the best note for an actor is a playable note um, and short and sweet and don't, don't get caught in an explanation trap. Don't explain your note, give a note and, and then the explanation is playing it. Whether it works or not, doesn't matter. It's just you know, to try things out. But, and the, and the thing to avoid is to never ask for results. When you, as soon as you ask for a result, the actor is outside of the scene watching themselves perform. 
wondering if you're if, if you're they're giving you what you've asked for. You want to keep your actors focused on each other and achieving something from from their scene partners always. Is a great a great book um, to read regarding that is called uh, The Actor and the Target. Um, so it, but the uh, it's it's a simple concept, but um, you, ha you have to keep your actors they you have to get, actors have a tendency to go up into their heads, especially if a director is explaining shit to them. Excuse me. Um, you it's like you give up a, a verb, a sub subtext, a fact, an image, and then run the scene or that or a section of the scene. You know. It's, yeah, that's great advice. Um, and then, uh, uh, Jeanette, do you have any thoughts on actors or how they can approach the industry if, from the actor's point of view kind of thing? What advice would you give to actors who want to make their own break? You know, um, get yourself out there. Get yourself out there and try. And um, again, like we've been saying, find your tribe, find your people, experiment, create, put content mm -hmm. out there. There's so many different places to put that there now. You you need to build who you are, curate who you are, um, and and really put yourself out there. I mean, I always feel like actors are probably the best at trying to constantly working, you know, taking classes, meeting people, being social interact, you know, act interacting with people socially and being uh, going where there's networking to be had. So, um, you know, and, and I'll give it, throw out one last call if anyone else has any questions. If not, it's so hot that I think we'll be happy to wrap <laughs> and be able to go enjoy air conditioning a little more. Um, and last call for any questions, because I obviously we've got such a great panel here. I'd love for them to ask, answer any questions and I don't want anyone to walk away without having their question answered. But I think we are getting close to calling it a day. Give you two more seconds to see if any other questions pop up. I want to thank you, panelists. You were absolutely wonderful. Um, and and with the, they've been doing a great job in the chat, pointing, putting up everything anyone's referred to. Um, I do have wrap up statements to make. If nobody else throws out a question, I'm going to move into wrapping up. All right, we got, we got a lovely thank you. I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping up. Um, so, you know, as a reminder, we're going to be holding a series of live panels over the next two days. So please take a look at the schedule of events on the web festival website. Join us for the first filmmaker panel tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., which will feature filmmakers for the films Those People Fight for the Future, Imelda and Luis, and Apart. Don't forget to watch the affiliated films before each panel. Our festival, oh, hold on, I will, I'll come, we've got another question. Thank you, Stella, for jumping in real quickly. It's not too late. Um, Stella would like to know, would you spend less without the tax incentives or double with tax incentives for a feature film? I think that's a Jeanette question. It is. Um, <laughs> the studio will tell you to hit a strike for the financier, whoever is buying and paying for it, will tell you to hit a strike price on that. And you just have to figure out what that is. If you chase a tax incentive, you're going to have to bring in your cast and your department heads to do that, and it'll take up your tax incentive. So most of the time, I like to shoot in California, even without the tax incentive, because there's a lot of talent here, and we're here, and the actors are here, and you can create something. So it's a matter of figuring out what it what is worth it. Is it is does your film is your film set in a cornfield maybe? or on a mountaintop, maybe you're not shooting it in Los Angeles, maybe you are chasing a tax incentive, but you really gotta see who's shooting out there, is it worth it, is there any crew, who are you bringing in? Like it is a can of worms to chase something. Good, thank you Stella for the question. Thank you Jeanette for that answer. Yep. So um, just to wrap up again, there's gonna be the filmmaker panel tomorrow at 10 a.m. The festival awards ceremony will begin at 3.30 p.m. on Sunday, followed by a networking event at 4 p.m. Okay, this is great though. They'll be raffling off a free course at the awards ceremony. That's a lot of money, people. So you don't want to miss that. <laughs> also, please visit the Entertainment Studies website to learn about our free upcoming seminars, scholarships, and fall classes. Fall is currently open for enrollment, uh, and you can find the catalog and the classes in the chat. I just saw it popped up right there. Thank you again for everybody. Thank you, our lovely panelists. Thank you, everyone who joined us. And I hope everyone gets a chance to watch the films and enjoy the rest of the festival. I think we're done for the evening. Thank Bye. you so Bye. everyone. Thank, Thank you. Me. Nice to meet you guys. You Cheers. too. <laughs>